Wow, what a great view. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's feeling good. I am extremely honored and thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it's really important for me, uh, namely because this is my 25th conference in a row. I hope that's an exa it's an example of resilience and sustainability. Uh, and just for you to have the notion of how important that is to me, I have a 29 years old daughter and a 19 years old daughter. So that also means that I was president of IIA 19 years ago. And as you can see, IIA is part of my life, as much as my, my family and it's part of my, my family indeed. Okay, so my challenge today, ah, and I forgot a very important thing. I'm gonna be a grandma. Coming over, so. You know, that, it's, it's all part of AI and myself. It's, it's really good. So resilience and sustainability. Um, we had a really interesting talk just now, keynote, and I hope that I'll be able to bring some bit of a different angle uh, to complement the very important messages already brought here. The concept of resilience and interestingly, I found a paper by uh, the gurus of resilience from 2002, exactly also making the linkage between resilience and sustainability. The capacity to buffer, change, learn, and develop. I found this sentence really interesting, really full and rich of what resilience is about providing a framework to understand how to sustain and enhance adaptive capacity in a complex world of rapid transformations. Lots of messages here. So when we think, and I wanted to link also to impact assessment, resilience, sustainability, and impact assessment. What is that we definitely have in common? The concept of dynamics, or the actual dynamics, change, and learning. These are common features to all of the three, looking into the future of systems. So I will um, address you on three different views. One, the analytical view, perhaps the most common. Second, the philosophical view. And third, the systemic view. From an analytical point of view, we typically think about prediction, prevention, planning, particularly if we're talking about disasters. So prediction is anticipating problems. It's typical of impact assessment as well. Prevention to, uh, to potential obstacles or problems. One of the major principles of environmental policy, together with uh, precaution, and planning for the protection of the present and the future. We just had a really good example of uh, important planning initiatives in Japan regarding biodiversity. We also have earthquakes. We also have disasters. And I thought that to talk about that, it would be better to use my own examples from home. So here is an image of, among thousands of images that we could get from the big floods in Madeira Island in, Atla in the Atlantic uh, in 2010. And uh, it was announced then, uh, well, a, few, a couple of years ago, that a multi-stakeholder framework loan would be contributing to repair and reconstruct the massive damage to public infrastructures in the Madeira Island strengthening its resilience to natural disasters and adaptation to climate change. Really important. The only problem is that they put everything back into the same place. So maybe they think that they might be able to control rain, 
Because if they're not able to control infrastructures, they might be able to control the source of the disaster. This is costing 145 US the uh, American a million dollars. I'm not gonna say who is the sponsor of this initiative because it could be embarrassing, but it is important that financial organizations actually look at where they're putting the money because what we should be investing is, for example, into um, social ecological structures and building up the ecosystem uh, structures that will enable prevention, in fact, and planning in a more wider sense. But here, there was one political issue that was very important. The governor of this region is a very was a very stubborn guy. And he said, there was no problem with Madeira and its urban occupation. We'll put it back exactly in the same place so that we demonstrate that. So, you know, these are the kind of attitudes that make it difficult to progress. When we look at the statistics, I, I went to the International Disasters Database just to see how things were going, and um, we look at the total number of reported disasters, and I looked at the technological and natural, and obviously we see a major uh, growth in the last few years, much more on the natural, of course, but uh, oh, sorry, much more on the technological, but uh, I, sorry, I said correct, much more on the natural, but in any case, it shows the same trend. When we look at the total death created or generated by these disasters, we realize that before we used to have more deaths due to natural disasters, now we have more deaths due to technological disasters. And then when we look at the total economic damage, and that was a really interesting uh, surprise to me, we spend much more money with natural disasters. Yet, when we do impact assessments, particularly environmental impact assessment, we worry much more about human initiatives and investments, and therefore the new technology that is in, introduced in the, into the environment. However, it's with the natural disasters that we spend more money. So we need to learn how to manage resilience and as Labelle and others said, strengthening the capacity of societies to manage resilience appears to be a key condition to effectively pursue sustainable development. This means that we need in fact to work on our ecological infrastructures, but that's not enough. We need to change the minds of those politicians, for example, decision makers that insist that what they have done before has been exactly the right thing despite whatever disasters might have happened. Now on the philosophical view, the work of Yoichi Kumagai, my dear friend who is around somewhere, uh, raised this important issue. There is good and bad resilience. There's not only good resilience. So if this is the truth, if X is resilient, is it sustainable? So is it really always a direct relationship between resilience and sustainability? Did you see Wally? You didn't, you should. It's a movie about resilience. They talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay? So the idea with Wally, for those that have not seen, is Earth, by the time humans have destroyed it completely, and the only thing that su survived is a, a co cockroach? cockroach and a computer. And then suddenly, some seeds was around there, and the little plant comes out. And when that happens, the humans that meanwhile had migrated to another planet found out that there is hope in Earth. 
because a seed came out and a little plant was growing. So they start to see the opportunity to return to Earth. Meanwhile, they just became fat big guys that didn't do anything because all the technology was doing everything for them. That's why I call it the ugly. So this is a really, I always recommend my students to see this movie. I think, if, that's why I'm telling you, you should see this movie. This is one impressive photo of resilience. You know, it shows strength. This is good resilience, okay? Despite whatever, the tree keeps the earth very much firmly grounded to the soil. But is this good resilience? This is also resilience. Unfortunately, it is very much resilient. Terrorism, Ebola, and all the other kind of health issues, eutrophication, land use change, social tensions in the age of turbulence. We're not being able to get rid of this, right? So that means it's resilient. Is it sustainable? Jared Diamond told us how previous civilizations disappeared exactly because they were not enough resilient. And then he also mentions that there's five main factors to collapse. Climate change, hostile neighbors, collapse of essential trading partners, environmental problems, and for me, is one of the most important, failure to adapt to environmental issues. There is resistance to change, which may be a major obstacle to good resilience. I like this, Charlie. I see you wearing grabby face again today. Yes, but the grabby woman will be, of today will be the grabby woman of tomorrow. So that is exactly what keeps us away from achieving more sustainable contexts. This girl is resilient, but is it sustainable? So I leave you with that thought. Now finally, the systemic view. We can think of this in terms of dynamic and adaptive change, but also in terms of how we deal with changes. So more than rebuilding infrastructure, it's about dealing with these changes, namely whether through biophysical, landscape ecological approaches or through more social governance and technological also approaches and ensure this transformation capacity. And here I'd like to follow Holling, Buzz Holling, and distinguish between engineering and systems, or ecological, as Buzz Holling defined engineering and ecological resilience. Engineering is the type of resilience that focuses on efficiency, constancy, predictability, the maintenance of current system structures and functions. To view, it's important. In particular cases, it's very important. And, and it's really based on the notion of recovering from the shock. But then there's also the ecological systems resilience, also defined by Holling, which focuses on persistence, change, and unpredictability in which the dealing with change is the most important aspect and ensure the transformative capacity. So we have these two perspectives. One is a more conservative one, or engineering oriented, looking at resilience in structures, whereby we try to be, to protect, predict, prevent against changes. But changes will happen. So we also need the transformative perspective in which we have to deal with changes. 
And change is a disruptive concept. Of course, we can change slowly, or we can change rapidly. We can move as usual, or maybe sometimes there's a need to change rapidly. And for that, we need change agents. And here I'd like to acknowledge the work of my dear friend, Lone Corn of Friends and colleagues who are working on this. So as uh, Nobel Prize Richard Feynman said, the thing that doesn't fit is the thing that's the most interesting. The part that doesn't go according to what you expected. So what best challenge could we have than this sentence to actually try to change and be different? Nature can be disruptive. Why can't we? So I gave you these three views on resilience and sustainability, my, the way I was reading it. I hope this might be inspiring, both to look into prediction, prevention, planning. Don't forget that there's good and bad resilience and that there's two possible ways to get there and maybe they need to be complementary structural and system approaches. And this is perhaps provocative, but I would say that we should go for good resilience and systems approach in order to get to sustainability. Because bad resilience will take either to disaster, if we're just looking at structural, or to unsustainable, if we're just looking at systems, and we want to do more than just being acceptable. So we need for, the need for change, and as the, the caterpillar thought that there was no more hope, and then suddenly it became a butterfly. And what better image than this one in a country that is so careful, so sweet, so gentle, such as Japan. Arigato. Thank you very much for your presentation.